people always ask how I balance my family life with 400 shows a year. I'm just doing what I love with the people I love. It's my magic life. I like Wes Isley. I like everything about him. All right, we're back. And this week we have a guy that we've been playing what Zoom tag with. Is that what you say? <laughs> this guy, uh, his internet went out. Crazy storms in Texas. He said it wouldn't be repaired for like another week. We rescheduled it for the next week. And then my schedule and his schedule didn't work because we're both entertainers. We both had shows. So week three, we finally got Alan Paletti. What's up? Uh, hey, Wes. Hi, Natalie. How are you guys doing? So tell me about these massive storms we had down there. Oh, they were, poof, they were they were the worst that I think I've ever seen ever. Um, you know, I, I, I born and raised in Michigan, but I've been here in Texas for almost twenty years now. And we, we you know we get bad weather's or in Tornado Alley or whatever. But um, th this was something else. This was like like a giant picked up our house and put it inside of a dishwasher. And you know, did like the pots and pans setting or something. It was cr you couldn't see. There was just torrential rain everywhere it, nuts nuts wow did you guys come out of it okay yeah we did thankfully um we had uh we had a couple of broken branches from a tree that were actually stuck in the tree we a lot of our neighbors had like their cheese like ripped out of the ground or knocked over or big limbs knocked out we had just a couple of things and i was able to get one of those pole saws and go up there and trim the ones i had to we got out of it um we're very lucky very lucky so was it a tornado no but we had uh there was like 70 and 80 mile per hour winds though so technically no tornado at least not in our area but pretty serious wind wow. they didn't consider it a hurricane or anything like that just a really uh, they happy. well they called them they said it would have been it would have been equivalent to hurricane winds so it was, okay. it was it was pretty insane <laughs> i've never seen anything like it i hope i never see it again yeah well send me pictures because this is three weeks in the making man that we yeah to I, I have it. some Okay. I've been driving around my neighborhood and taking photographs and going, oh, wow, look at that. Ooh. Well, send them. I don't do the podcast page here on the, on the Facebook group. I so sure um, I met you because you reached out to me when you bought my trick and you said, hey, I want to interview you for my YouTube channel. Yeah. And dude, we hit it off like right away, immediately became friends. Every once in a while, I get a phone call from you and we're on the phone hour, two hours, just talking. <laughs> about Longer just, for driving back from a gig. You know? yeah, I love it. And I've told you that I have a lot. I have that with a lot of my friends. If you need somebody to talk to in the middle of the night, I would hate for one of my entertainer friends to fall asleep. Thank God I have Natalie by my side and we take turns. The other day I was exhausted, tired, mm -hmm. and I, I hate doing it, but I pulled over and let her drive home. I couldn't sleep, mm. but I was so tired. I couldn't drive either. I get it over for the last half hour. And um, yeah, I put that out to you, man. Call me anytime. I I want to keep my friends alive. Oh, it saved me a couple of times already. I'll tell you, you know, just having that somebody to talk to and keeping your mind awake and engaged, it's it makes a big difference. Yeah, uh, I do shows all over Texas and then all over, uh, well, all over the U.S. But usually, I'm not driving for those, but sometimes I am. And um, I'm traveling. It's just like, yeah, oh my gosh, only another three hours to go. I'm gonna get home. <laughs> Huge yeah, expanses I in Texas. And those are the longest three hours of your life, it feels like sometimes. Yeah. You just want to be home. <laughs> it's just want to be there already. You know, I don't even remember being on the road by myself anymore because I've had her since 2005. 2000, wow. 2000, 2006. We met in 2005, though. Right. But I didn't start going to shows with you until 2006. You were going to shows with me pretty right away. We met at the end of 2005. It was 2006. Okay. She okay. knows better. She knows better. I'll stop. Don't <laughs> never but, argue but about timelines with your wife. They're always right. Yeah, <laughs> 2005. So it had to be 2005, but I got you. I got you. But um, yeah, it's just, it's night and day different, man. So many things is so much better with a partner. We just wrote a new bit today for our show. And it's like, you know, it's me introducing Natalie formally in the show, which I've never done before. Kind of, I have. Hey, it's my wife, Natalie, my little girl, Lana. You know, and then I talk about him. That's it. This one actually introduces her. And uh, Ellie took 16 years <laughs> to write that in the show. <laughs> and it's not ready yet. I've done it a total two times and I'm not comfortable. So. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. So uh, how'd you, what's your start magic now that you're performing all over the U U.S.? Let's go back uh, to the beginning. How'd you I, Well, you know, my, 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 um, 
my kind of silly flippant answer when people ask me that when I'm performing, I, I tell them that I was bitten by a radioactive magician, uh, <laughs> which is um, apocryphal. Um, but no, I, I saw um, World's Greatest Magic in the early 90s, and I saw Lance Burton perform, and uh, he did his dove act, and I went, oh, okay, <laughs> I'm going to do that. And then and then after that, he did his, um, um, uh, what was it, the... Um, the trunk when he was doing like the sword fighting thing. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's incredible. And um, I was able to, at a young age, be able to like, I was saw there was an, it was in a theater. There was an audience full of people. And I saw this is actually happening for the people in that theater too. How is, how is this? What is this? This is, it was for me, it was as close to being a superhero as you could possibly be. And I, what young boy doesn't want to become a superhero. So it's kind of how I got, grabbed into magic and then i got a mr creepy magic kit which you saw um so I put group for just magicians and i have magicians not magicians Thirty thousand members now and i posted wow. mr he was a magic kit from the 90s mm -hmm. and he texted right back here's mine he was in his closet <laughs> <laughs> I have, it's right over there and i have a cool story about that too if, if we have time i'd love to share it yeah um so so i got it that was my first magic kit ever and that was like, my mom saw that, you know, I was really into the show. And so she got me that kit. And of course I, I, I got sucked in and I practiced everything religiously. And there was a little bit of nepotism that went on because she was the activities director at the townhouses that we lived at. So there was a clubhouse. She had to plan all the things, all the brunches and the holiday celebrations and everything. And so she booked, booked me to do my first public show. And we had them all laid out on a coffee table and we had, uh, paper towels over top of each trick so when it was time to introduce the next one i just take the paper towel off and do the trick for everybody my sister was my assistant and then i would just go through all the tricks there's a home video of it somewhere um cre creepy props yeah yeah <laughs> which was wow. like, uh, but so i had that and it was uh, you know it was um i had a lot of fond memories of that uh kit and then somewhere lost the time my original set that i had when i was a child disappeared like a lot of our our childhood toys do and i was talking about it on my youtube channel once and i had a a viewer of the channel hunt down a copy of it from ebay and send it to me so this is my replacement copy of the mr creepy magic kit from when i was a child it's exactly the same year and artwork and everything down perfectly to how i remember it um that was probably one of the most thoughtful, meaningful gifts I've ever received. So it was super cool. That is so awesome. None of my fans ever sent me magic. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get emails. I get people telling me they love it, but I've never gotten magic kits. So now we got something to shoot for. <laughs> I just got a, well, I got another, I actually got a, it's weird because I got another magic kit from, from another fan uh, that was a hundred years old. Wow. wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's the Aladdin semi-professional. Say again. Was it uh, Mr. Magic? No, it's um, it's called the Aladdin semi-professional Magic Act. And wow. uh, yeah. yeah, it's super cool. It had it had uh, a name written on it on like the magic book that came with it, and a couple of other things inside the kit. And so I searched that name, and I found out that uh, she was a it was owned by a girl. Which is surprising for a hundred years ago to find that's not a very, you know, it's very male dominated art. And Today, so this much less a hundred years ago, or even even a hundred years. She she was a Texas A and M uh, alumni and uh, did amazing stuff. She she passed away. I think it was like twenty ten or twenty eleven. But um, she had a, lived an amazing life. And um, yeah, it was just it was really cool to have that connection to that person and to try to imagine like. I, I, cause I had to figure out, like, I want to figure out how old the kit was. And so I had to kind of do some investigative work. I was like, well, there's a name there. If I see if I can find that name, I know I got it in Texas. Maybe that name means something in Texas. Found a, per found that person, only person, a very unique name. And then I found out, you know, um, there was a obituary and a birth date and a death date. And I was going, okay, well, you know, likely she, it also had like when she was married, what year she was married. And I was like, well, she probably got this kit before she was married because it was kind of like a children's kit and so i got get was able to place the timeline with that and also some um you know historical 
uh, documents that I was able to find about the company that existed at that time to that produced that kit. So I was able to place the time at about, I, think it was, I say a hundred years, it was like 87 or 88 years ago. So it was, it's really, I don't, people just keep giving me magic kits. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's awesome, man. I have, I've bought magic collections. I, I have a Eugene Berger uh, book for sale right now on my website. Oh, it's wow. And wow. it's, I'm just making up a name, Trevor Nelson. And I took it to my magic club and I said, Hey, I also have this for sale. If anybody wants it, if my name was Trevor Nelson, I'd want it. And I'm like, well, it is autographed. I'm not lying, but it's not autographed to you. It doesn't just say Eugene Berger, but it's autographed. Yeah. But never in a million years would I do the research to find out who, and I'm making up the name, mm-hmm. Trevor Nelson. I would never do the, re- you took the research and found out where she went to college and she got married. And her boy- Well, That's- I mean, I, I had the motivation oh, because I wanted to share it on my YouTube channel. I've, I've kind of become known as a historian or documentarian or something. Uh, a number of years ago, I was gifted a bunch of old magic books that are 100 plus years old and some mail order catalogs for for magic props and things. And that's up in the closet over there, too. And that was gifted to me by a dentist that I met when I was doing a, a show for a, a local magazine here. And they were doing like some kind of 100 best dentists of Dallas thing. And I met him there and his grandfather was a magician and he had a bunch of his grandfather's old stuff. And I got those. And so I went through those on my YouTube channel and like went through page by page, you know, carefully white glove, you know, kind of showing all of the pages there. And then somebody saw that and it was like, oh, well, I'll get him, you know, that kit and then I'll get this kit. So people keep sending me very, very old magic books and you know, um, memorabilia and all that kind of stuff. And so I just document it and show it on my YouTube channel. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not what I set out to do. <laughs> it's necessarily yeah. not the focus of the channel, but it's cool. I, and I love it. And I take very good care of those things, try to preserve them as best I can. You got me jealous over here. I want to start a YouTube channel. Natalie, can we get chat GPT to help us like find the origin of gold bars? Do you think that would work? <laughs> I think uh, I think we have enough on our plate. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, let's, let's, I was too smooth though. I was too smooth. Who thinks I'm going to do it? Um, yeah. Dude, that's awesome though, man. Oh, yeah, thanks so, for letting me talk about it. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's really cool. I like it. That's awesome. And going back and doing like uh, the history of all this stuff. That's that's fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I think so too. I mean, it's a, you know, it's um, it's our heritage, you know, and if we don't do it, there's certainly nobody else that's going to be invested in it, you know. Um, so you can't expect the public to have some kind of. I think that's why Copperfield's got his whole thing out in Vegas, you know. Which I right. think you were just out in Vegas, weren't you guys? Yeah, yeah, we had an amazing time out there. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was reading my Houdini books, I don't know if you could see that pile of Houdini books there. Yes. Um, when I was reading Houdini, there's always a third of the book dedicated to uh, spirit mediums and people. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, dude, just get to the good stuff. I'm here for the magic. Mm-hmm. But as I got older, mm-hmm. I started to realize, dude, he was passionate about it because he lost his parents. He was trying to contact them. And he found all these people ripping people off. So that's where the passion came from. Where as a youth, I read those books and I was skipping through that. I don't care about that. I don't care about that. But as an adult, I find myself going towards those because I know the methods of the magic he was doing. So now I'm looking at the spiritual spiritualism stuff and how he was debunking it. And I get the passion for that now. Yeah. That's, that's kind of cool to me. The history of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, yeah. For, for me too. That's something I like to do periodically is I'll go back and I mean, maybe it's with magic books or, 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 which is actually often the case. I think that we, we skip around a lot when we're younger, we'll get, if we get a magic book, right. There's so many options now. Um, but uh, you know, I was, I got, I wish I could show you my, my, I have, I have two bookshelves filled with magic books from all time periods and authors across the world. And, um, you know, you kind of skip around, you're like, well, where's that next thing that I might want to try or whatever. And then you skip so much good stuff because you're just not, you're not ready for it. And I think it's kind of a cool gift that you get to go back and, and rediscover treasures that are already that you already have they didn't know so yeah I, I wasn't ready for it um you know your librarian is going to recommend you houdini you tell them you're into magic well here's houdini books mm-hmm. but you're not ready for the spiritualism stuff you just no. yeah 
ten year old kid. No. You just want the magic. Yeah, yeah, I was just there for the magic. It's like, how do I how do I, I pull want... my thumb off? I, I want to learn that one. Yeah, I want to know how you lock a girl in a trunk and throw in a river. How does she live? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. It's 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 a twin. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, so uh, that's not good. You gotta keep making twins. That's not good. You gotta call David Bowie to make you some uh, some clones. I think is uh, that's a that, that's a very um, esoteric reference. Sorry. Yeah, you have to explain that one to me. I don't know it. I, know. I, time, I was but... the Prestige. Uh, there was a film that came out a couple of years ago with um, oh gosh, what's his name? But David, well, David, Bowie, yeah. David Bowie's in it. He plays uh, Tesla, Nikola Tesla. I didn't know that. Oh. I didn't know that was David Bowie. Yeah, that's David Bowie. <laughs> I own the DVD. I never put two and two together. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's funny. Wizard yeah. of Menlo Park. Yeah. Well, that came out the same time as The Illusionist. And yeah. both of them were good. Whatever. One was better than the other because it had a sci fi ending. I didn't like the sci fi ending. I don't yeah. remember which yeah. one. But then it was like, okay. It was just, it was a period piece. One of them, they killed a bird. So then every time I produce a dove, people think I'm killing a bird. And it's like, no, 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 no. No, they okay. didn't care back then. It was a nickel. They didn't, and they were going to eat it anyway. They, they <laughs> didn't have any money. <laughs> did, did I tell you the story, Wes? Because we've talked a lot. And um, there was there's a story. Being here in Texas, um, it could, we get very, very hot summers. It can it can get up to like 120, 25 degrees outside. It gets very hot here. And there's a story. I'll, I'll, they show, the person shall remain nameless, but there's a story about a magician, stage magician, did dove work here in, in Texas, who is doing a, a stage act for a, a festival. And they go to produce the dove, and the dove had passed away from heat exhaustion, mm. and, um, which is terrible. But he's about to produce the dove, and he doesn't know, right? And so he produces the dove, and the dove is unalive. And uh, so to not scare the children, he takes it. And he goes, look, it's alive. Like this, and shakes it. Oh, and wow. It's the most macabre thing ever. But then he just takes it and then, you know, quickly puts it away. And then, and then never talked about it again, except for, you know, close friends or whatever. But it was just like, you know, maybe don't do a dove act in 125 degree weather. Right. <laughs> It doesn't get that hot here, but we've had some really hot days and we've had to pull an audible and be like, no, no, they're just going to stay. We're just going to, they're going to stay in their little carry cages and spritz them down and they just get to take nope. that show off because you can't. We have water misters we can spray them with, but yeah. Uh, yeah. We even then, you don't, yeah. One time I saw them panting and I'm like, oh, this isn't good. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Dove is panting. That's not good. That's not good. So we threw them right in the RV, the air conditioner. Yeah. But, um, and we can take them out of the show. That's easy. We can take them out of the show. We don't need them. We just did the, um, we just did a show in Maryland and I just didn't bring animals because they were like, Hey, Wes is going to headline the show. And I said, I'm going to do it animal free tonight. Let's go. And uh, it went great. Yeah. It went awesome. Yeah. And it's weird because it's like a cast member that you don't have. You don't yeah. have those bits in the show. And it's weird. It's like working with a hand tied behind your back. But it's like, yeah, but I can still do that. That's yeah. kind of neat. Yeah. And then there's also, if, if it's warm, but not too warm, but you don't want to leave them for a while. He's got me, so I can load them right before they need to be produced. So they're in there for like yeah, can... 30 seconds, and then they're produced. So Working with a partner, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she can literally load it as I produce it. So. But if it was 125 degrees, I wouldn't even put it in a load chamber for 30 seconds. Yeah. That's too much. I just I put her in boxes. Fair. Who's out there in 120 degree weather? We don't have an. We'd be stuck inside nine months of the year. You know, <laughs> like we can't do that. It's like who goes outside when it's snowing outside? You know. I put her in boxes at a relay for life, and she came out. And she like a wet dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, it was yeah. rough. Y'all are, uh, right. are cool. So tell me, let's get back to you. Let's do your story here. So it started with Mr. Creepy. Yeah, I'm guessing you're about 10 years younger than me because I felt like I was too old for Mr. Creepy when it came out. Um, I don't know if you want to say your age. I'm 37 this year. We're exactly yeah. 10 years younger. I guess that right away. You'll turn 47 in November is how old he'll be. I do have this little rope thing, though, for the people that are watching. Oh, like, yeah. I get on camera. And that's not Mr. Creepy, is it? No, no, but I, I don't, at least maybe. maybe yeah. 
And then when it oh, separates, I'm going to get it. It looks like Mr. What? Look at that. <laughs> it's in the, uh, it's in the style try. of a Mr. Creepy. Yeah. But I haven't seen that one. That's that's oh, great. No. Yeah, I got some toys. I but love yeah, that. I love Mr. Creepy, but I felt like Mr. Creepy was geared towards a younger generation when I was 17, you know? 18 it when is. it came out. It yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah, I would if uh, if I was seventeen year old me probably wouldn't go, have gone for it, right? Yeah, yeah, and and I was just getting introduced to girls, and uh, my money was getting spent elsewhere at that point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's talk about let's talk about you and your shows. So, what kind of shows do you do? Are you, I I in my head, and we know each other, we talk a lot, but I don't know. I've I've seen your website, I've seen your stuff, I've talked to you. I'm thinking like trade shows and mentalism. How close am I? That's that's about eighty percent of it. Okay. <laughs> so pretty pretty close. Okay. Um, yeah. So I do I do trade shows. Um, and for anybody who goes, I, I talk to people about this like whenever they, you know, I'll bring up the idea or something if I'm working with a company for just a cocktail hour or whatever, and I know that that company does trade shows. Like, can you introduce me to you guys? Love me? Can you introduce me to whoever organizes your trade shows? Whatever. Um, th- there there's this kind of response that you get a lot of the time, which is like. What's a how, how does a how does that work, you know? Um, so so briefly, basically, I'm a professional presenter, and I use magic to help tell the story for the client. So in a, in a nutshell, that's it. Um, I think it's I think it's a lot more powerful and useful than that, but in a nutshell, um, mentalism is a big part of it. I like mentalism because it allows me to perform on just about any size stage with the minimum of props. And uh, if I'm doing traveling a lot, I don't like, yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I was doing a lecture at the Dallas Magic Club a couple of months ago, and there's a very good and dear, uh, well, married magic couple. I seem to collect those. <laughs> uh, but David and Kylie Knight. I don't know if you know them, but they're a fantastic uh, couple. Yes. Of team. Wait, okay. I, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, yes. Uh, he used to work with uh, Kevin Spencer, correct? Uh, you might have the information. I don't know. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Um, they are a Christian. They go to like churches and they perform. They used to work with Kevin and... Spencer. Okay. I'm not percent sure. Yes. Oh, nice. Okay. So, yeah. So they're fantastic people. And I love them dearly. Um, uh, but th- during the lecture, I-, I gave them a little bit of a hard time because I was like, everybody's going, oh, I hate you. You know, you could, you could do a, you know, 45 minutes with a deck of cards and a, you know, a watch and slips of paper or something. And um, between, they broke up my lecture into two parts. So I had the first part broke. And in between, they had had some performances, right? They had some of the hobbyists that want to come up and do some tricks for the club or whatever. And then I went back on for the second half and they had left their table on the stage. And so I get up and I push the table and I go, look guys, I'm a grand illusionist that I pushed the table. Out of the way. He gives me this look like, you know, there's just fire in his eyes. He's shaking his fist at me. And I was like, well, you know, we got to poke fun at each other a little, you know, so. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me about your lecture. I mean, is that available? Are you? Would you tour the lecture? I have people fifty three different countries and all over America listening. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, so you? the lecture. Thank you for asking. Yeah, the the lecture that I did for them was was specifically for them. The organizer had asked me. Um, the club was uh, was struggling with a couple of things, and the person who asked me to come, who's the uh, president now for for the Dallas Magic Club. Um, she said, there's a couple things that I think that they might need to hear from somebody who's actually a professional and does this. And, you know, um, I mean, stuff we all know, like I say, we all know it's a curse of knowledge, but things that like you and I would know as performers, Natalie would know, um, David and Kylie Knight would know who are in that audience. But, you know, like it's not about the amount of tricks that you can do. It's about the quality of the magic that you can perform um i mean I, I, the same three to f- seven tricks have taken me all around the country you know um i don't need to 
constantly be updating or adding new things. It's like, I don't want to add it to my show until it's right. And that sometimes that takes a long time. Um, so things like that, that hobbyists just, they want to buy the next thing and they want to buy the next thing and they want to buy the next thing to show up their buddies at the bar, but they don't really want to put the time and the work in uh, something like your effect, right. Um, or trick. I, I, I don't know. So we have both people listening. So um, either, either is fun. <laughs> okay. I've it's never like been a, I've never, I've never cared. Yeah, call it. I've never, I've never had. I don't. I've, I just, I, I, I tend to use effect just as a, as a knee jerk. But then I I'd also don't want to like alienate half your audience and go, what, what was he talking about? So, um, yeah. I'll just use trick. Um, but like with, with your trick, uh, that requires work, right? There's some stuff you have to do to, to do that well, right? Uh, and, and it's not something that you should. Well, I think Penn talked about this, didn't he? Didn't he say, oh, you know, I love that trick. I'm going to add it to the show and then maybe tell the story better than I would. But yeah, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was crazy with Penn. It was crazy for several different reasons. I'll tell you some others off the air. But Penn loved it. But then, then he um, needed, he had Teller do it. And then he did the talking, had Teller do the, all the, the trick yeah. um, for a whole nother reason. And it wasn't practice. But um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Where were we going with that? You need to work on it. You need to work on it. You yeah. need to work on it. <laughs> it's not something you can get. Right and he that. and and they're workers, man. So when we were in Vegas, I was talking to Moxie, um, Penn's kid, and I said, "Hey, we're in Vegas. You said you wanted to show me around or tell me some cool spots. We just landed." And Moxie said, "Well, I'm leaving town." I said, "Well, crap. That didn't work at all." <laughs> well, I'm going to Dad's rehearsal in an hour. If you guys want to come hang out and see uh, dad and, and tell her rehearse, um, you know, I have some things to do downstairs, but I can't invite you. You have to ask dad. Mm -hmm. So I text Dan, Hey, can I come over? And, and he's like, yeah, come on. So uh, it was amazing. But where was I going with that story? They were working on a trick. Oh, they rehearsing. Were very <laughs> detailed. It was very detailed. Like every single little step was analyzed and trying to get it figured out. So it was perfect pretty much. Um, but yeah, I tell people it. two and a half hours, we got to see Penn and Teller rehearse and they got this much done. I'm holding my right. fingers where there's a little bit of air. <laughs> I mean, it was nothing. They got nothing accomplished, but they got a lot accomplished. I mean, they had to bring down the screen forward, backwards, up, down, what height exactly. They took a tape measure exactly where they wanted it mm -hmm. for clear for their hand gesture or whatever. It was just, yeah, so, stuff you don't think about. You yeah. think that just drops. Just because you get good at, at what you do doesn't mean you don't have to rehearse. And the entire team was there. The stage manager, the construction builder that they had on staff, uh, the backstage hands resetting stuff when they were keep producing stuff or breaking something. They had to keep resetting it. Uh, comedy writer was there. Um, they had people on both sides of the audience watching for angles. And then um, I filled in for Teller at one point, and I was so happy. And I'm right yeah. next to Penn, and I'm like, I'm here, I'm here. And I'm just holding the prop, just being Teller. And Teller's in the audience looking at how it all looks. And I was like, man, this is awesome. <laughs> she was like, I want to take pictures, but we were at their rehearsal. We couldn't take yeah. Oh, but that is cool. I, yeah. Did I tell you about the first time that I met Penn? No. Uh, I was, I, I don't know how much I can share, um, but it was, it was, it was here in Texas. It was in a neighboring city. There is... I, I think I can tell you that. I think I can tell you this. I'm not going to get into my show. Um, there is um, the owner of a, of a company called Gearbox Studios. They, they make uh, video games, Borderlands and uh, some, some other ones. Tiny Tina's Wonderland. Um, the owner, say again? Terror and pain. Pain and terror. Pain, pain and terror. Um, yeah. okay. The owner of that, his name is Randy Pitchford. He also owns, I believe it's now Genie Magazine. Um and castle and the magic castle uh he's uh, he's not a neighbor but he's in a neighboring city and i've got a cool he's got a short list of people that he invites over to his house for different events and um he had brought pen out to his house to perform a show and <laughs> I remember um, that's I was I was I had got there early. I have a friend uh, which is he's also a, a Fulas alumni. His name's uh, Trig Watson. Yeah, and you know you probably know Trig. Um, great great guy, great guy, and I've known him forever. He used to live here in Texas, down in Dallas, and him and I used to work on a lot of things that he's 
performed and it's been very proud to see that um but he's like that's how i got my in he was performing there one time and then he got it permitted an invite invitation and then invited me and so i show up early because i'm always punctual and he goes oh it's fine just just go knock on the door they'll let you in and i was like oh okay cool so i knock on the door let me in there's a personal assistant and there's like no one else there and i'm like oh okay <laughs> and the person assistant's very friendly very helpful and he goes can i get you anything you want a beer or something i was like sure uh, so i'm sitting there drinking a rolling rock at this kitchen island that's i mean as big as uh I, gosh it's bigger than my kitchen table it's just just little island thing it's huge it's actually about half the size of my garage is about how big it is it's it's wow. huge and it's just a kitchen island right <laughs> so i'm sitting there and i'm drinking my rolling rock feeling like a little tiny awkward person who is certainly imposing on everyone and way too early and then i hear the garage door open and then i hear it close and I hear some talking and then I see this moving shape and it's, and it's a very tall moving shape. And I'm like half rolling rock in my mouth and Penn Gillette walks in and goes, how's it going? And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, hi, how are you? <laughs> That's the first time I met him. I, I had rolling rock coming out of my nose and <laughs> So uh, if he ever tells you a story about an awkward guy, bald guy that he met in Dallas one time at Randy Pitchford's house, it's, it's, it's me. <laughs> I, I love him so much. And we were at uh, MGM. We were going to go see them that night. And I remember in the 90s and late 80s, they were like, yeah, you might see us just walking to a local coffee shop between shows because there's nothing to do. We're bored backstage. So I remember taking a, a date in the 90s to a, a theater show, and I got there way too early. I had a magic van that I was, and I had a DVD player, and we watched in the parking garage uh, Penn and Teller get killed on DVD. Oh. On DVD. It was DVD. We watched it in the parking lot, and I'm looking, hopefully seeing them just well. I just wanted to see them. I was just so in love with Penn and Teller. That's then we so go to cool. MG MGM in Maryland yeah, to see them last this summer. And we're yeah. just walking around ahead of time. And daggone it, if Penn Gillette isn't just sitting there at the bistro, from me to her, I'm walking by and I'm like, <laughs> dude, Did and we know each other. No, we know each other at this point. And it's still like, I want to spit out my coffee because I'm like, he's just in the open. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah, I love him where's, so much, man. Where's all the security guards with the little earpieces and the, you know? No, no kidding. Yeah. But, uh, I yeah, I still get, I still geek out, but it's after about what a minute and a half. Yeah, it takes me a minute and a half to calm down. Yeah, I went back to his dressing room in Vegas, and I'm in there. I'm going. I'm looking all around, and he just looks at me and it's like, "What are you doing? I'm trying to take it all in, Ben?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm just what? A, what? A, in had, the brain? He had all these pictures of his kids. He had pictures of of him with all these celebrities and I'm trying to I'm trying to take them all in mentally but I can't I can't remember it all but I must have looked like I was like chasing a fly with my eyeballs is what it must have looked like <laughs> yeah. well it's better than like getting the camera out and like that and be like what are you doing like <laughs> opening the underwear drawer putting the well, camera in there with talking it. to him at that point I'm sitting there looking around and he looked at me like it's <laughs> crazy <laughs> So, and, it, and then the next night we renew our vows and Penn and Teller give her away. It was just Aww. what an amazing, That's amazing, beautiful. amazing That's trip. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to you. We're too much into me now. Um, what's your favorite audience perform for? Is it the trade shows? Is it close up stage? I, I like them all for different reasons. Um, feels kind of like picking your favorite child. I get it. I like them all. <laughs> I go like the same way. I get it. Yeah, um, with a with Natalie, a gun to my head. <laughs> it's, it's... Natalie likes theater shows. That's her favorite. It is okay because we get to do the big box illusions, and that's that's my favorite. I just like now. I don't enjoy setting them up and taking them down, but no. the actual performing of them is so much fun. And the gasps and the oohs and the ahs you get from from the ones that we do, and it, it's just fun. It's just really fun. And then I did a close-up gig the other day, and she's like, yeah, those aren't my favorite. Because yeah. she just follows me around with the camera. Yeah. 
right? And, so, and I've seen all the magic. So at this point, I'm watching the audience. But when it's a hot day and you're just watching the audience melt, it's different. <laughs> it was, they were having a good time. Before they were having a good time, they just smile. But they were so hot, they were just like, Oh, you know, it wasn't like, whoa, and like the big reactions you get because they were hot. Yeah, like, county fairs, they don't clap, man. Yeah. They don't. They're no, I, well, yeah. I'm... That's exerting energy. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, <sighs> all right. Well, let's, let's go to something else here. Uh, give me a, give me a crazy sh uh, show business story. Not that, not the dead dove. I just read a book the other day about Johnny Thompson that um, he was talking to a magic friend of his or somebody backstage. And then his wife's like, you have to go on now. That was your intro. And he's like, oh, crap. And he ran out on stage and he started producing his silks. And then he goes for his dove steal. And there's no dove? There's no dove. So he just starts, he throws it down and then does another dove, I mean, another silk and just flutters it. He doesn't have any dove. <laughs> and he tried to make it like it was a silk act. Like, I'm just, I'm just pulling oh up silks God. and waving them now. But he did all the movement like he was doing the dove. And <laughs> when she came, she came out with the magic wand to put the dove on. He's like, I don't have any words. <laughs> but I think this was at a magic convention. And he just told him at the second part. And he said, hey, I'm going to go back and do that first part. Because uh, <laughs> I wasn't... <laughs> I'm gonna get this book. I'm gonna get this book. I get it. Oh my gosh. Uh, uh. Has this ever happened to you? A collection of magic magicians full pause. Have you ever seen that? No, but I need to get it now. Dude, this whole book is just loaded. Everybody's in it too. Uh let me try to find the name. Do -do 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 -do. I don't know that name. Ali Bongo's in here. Uh Andy Dallas. Uh Murray Hatfield, Marsha Brodine, everybody has full pause in their show. So that was Johnny Thompson. Something, it's you, live entertainment. Something's bound to happen eventually. It, it will, right? Yeah. That's it's just uh, handle it with grace and style as much as you can and move on. <laughs> you know. So you got any crazy ones? Uh, yeah, I haven't shared publicly, though. Um, this might, I guess this is as good place as any. Um, Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> We finally right. did ours. We've done I, ours several times. Yeah. I gotta psych myself up for this. So it's something that happened to me at a show. Um, um, okay. All right. All right. I'll just I'll just tell the story. It's fine. So uh, a number of years ago, I got booked through an entertainment agency, and that entertainment agency it was for a festival, and it was supposed to be three hours of walk around. It was in September, so it was starting to cool off a little bit. It wasn't so bad. So three hours of walk around, just kind of like engaging, uh, you know, wh whoever the attendees were, like in lines to get corn dogs or, you know, on their way to the do whatever. So it was just supposed to walk around and do magic. And then at the end, a stage show, a half an hour stage show. And so it was wor worked out that I was supposed to walk around, kind of promote that I was doing the show later in the evening get people to hopefully stay and then come and see the show. Right. So that was the idea. And it was fine. You know, I was having a good time. I was interacting with lots of different families and, and they were like, Oh my gosh, when's your show? It's, it's at six 45. Oh, great. We're just excellent. We're going to, we're going to come to that. Great. I look, look forward to seeing you having a great energy. And um, then, you know, I have a little bit of a break to kind of get ready for my show. At my stage show and so i get it all put together i'm on stage working on the lighting and all the kind of stuff it was actually a pretty fancy outdoor stage and um there's an act before me there's a musical act that's supposed to kind of warm up and then allow me to go on and while that's happening i'm waiting in the wings and i get approached by two police officers i'm like okay uh hello officer what can i do for you and he's like uh, i need you to come with me Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, we stand off to the side and they say, we've got some complaints that you have been talking uh, to children. We had some concerned mothers saying that there's some guy walking around with playing cards talking to children. Oh, and yeah. I said, I said, yes, sir. That's, that's my job. I don't talk to children without their parents or their parents' consent, but that's, that's true. I have been performing magic for kids and uh, I'm, a hired entertainer i'm supposed to be here with this agency and he goes well we're going to need to verify that right so like i'm supposed to be on stage now right 
they're announcing me and I'm standing over there being detained by, by two officers while they sort out if I'm supposed to actually be there. And so we, fi I finally get a hold of the agent. The agent gets a hold of their contact for the show. They say they have to wait until they actually get the person who is in charge of running the festival physically there to then okay me to be able to go. So they do. The lady shows up and goes, yeah, what are you guys doing? Leave them alone. I paid them to be here. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are wasting me money now, right? Go away. And so the officers leave and apologize later uh, in, a, in a letter. Um, and then I go on and do my show. So I've been detained by two officers and questioned up the thing for like 15, 20 minutes. Everybody's waiting for me to show up. And then I have to walk on stage flustered out of my mind and okay. embarrassed and distraught. And then I have to go and perform a magic show and pretend like nothing happened. You know, uh, that was probably the worst thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. Wow. Never <laughs> shared that story publicly. <laughs> you know, I would have, you know, I would have thought I was, I was thinking that he got in that line and got a chili dog and his stomach was upset. That's what I was thinking. I, I was thinking <laughs> it was way worse. Yeah. I don't understand how they could misunderstand what was going on. Like, wow. That's yeah. Weird. So oh, they okay. changed. I don't, I don't work with that agency anymore because I think they mishandled it after the fact. Um, I won't name any names, but uh, so I don't work with them anymore. I got an issued apology from the city and um, they also introduced changes. My suggested changes now that all the entertainers there that still perform for that um, are given official badges to wear when they're out performing and so those are things that were and then a couple of other suggestions but yeah so it's like mm, that's not let that happen to anybody else ever so yeah. wow oh, man. can you awesome. believe that yeah it was just like <sighs> well i had i had a, a card a signed card vanishes from the deck and reappears in the back of the audience in a nest of boxes were mm. you at that show yes that was the very first show i ever saw you do <laughs> i have the guy sign the card it vanishes from the deck. Where could it be? And we do some by play. It could be here. It could be here. No, just kidding. It's actually way back. Hey, guys, what are you doing? It was surrounded by city cops and uh, security guards at the mall because there was a package just on a on a railing in the back <laughs> of, in the back of the audience that they thought bomb squad had thought that somebody just dropped. It. I'm like, that's part of the show. <laughs> Leave and it alone. Oh, Stop. Touching it, it down in it because it's twelve layers deep. That's the that's the whole joke. It's deep. It's deep, and you you by play with the people. It's twelve layers deep, and they're digging down in this thing, and it's like, oh my god, down in it. But yeah, I <laughs> that was surprising to me because I you would have thought they knew that was part of the show because there's three hundred people this way. I don't know, fifty feet from them. It was crazy. Yeah, but I didn't get detained or anything. I didn't get questioned. But that was. Just, that was, and I didn't have an assistant that was looking out for me back yeah, then. Yeah, I, I, I was at the show. It was the first show I ever saw him do, and I saw them surrounding the box, and I was like, "What did they just find? Like, what's going on?" Because you didn't know that was my blow no up. Idea. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. I was watching it happen, like one eye on the show and one eye watching these people open this box. I'm like, because they got surrounded. Which direction do I need to head? You know. <laughs> <laughs> gonna blow up exactly <laughs> my goodness <laughs> that's that's hilarious <laughs> uh the small mall cops they thought they actually had something to do that day um <laughs> all right so we've talked a lot uh hours on the phone just you know yeah. I, i'd say it's like two school girls because we just talk 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 but michigan texas mm -hmm. you have a variety of friends from all those different places uh, you had Jeff Williams from Michigan. Jeff Williams lives in Florida now, but he knew him back when he lived in Michigan. Oh, nice. Um, Dan Sperry, you're friends with that crew, Nick DeFott, that whole crew as well? Yep. Yep. And then down in Texas, uh, uh, Snap Duda, are you friends with, I don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bizarro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I blanked on the name. All I could remember was Snap Duda. Snap Duda. Well, I, you know, it was easy That's enough, yeah. Yeah, and then um, uh, and then uh, Diamond Jim, you're friends with Diamond Jim down there too. Very close with Diamond Jim. Yeah, that's amazing. You got all this 
So I'm in Virginia, man. I, I have to reach out to my magic friends. I, I, I'm i 100 miles from the nearest big club from me. So. Oh, well, you get to be an oasis in the desert then. You get yeah. To be yeah. Look, I fly around myself here. Um, so what do you what do you see in five years for where you're going to be? Uh, probably still be bald. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah. sorry. No, I, you know, uh, well, COVID, COVID kind of kicked uh, my butt a little bit in terms of contacts and business relationships that I had. A lot of those people that I was working with kind of relocated or found other jobs or did other things. And uh, so I have been in the process since 2020, well, really since second half of 2021, whenever anything really kind of opened back up and we were able to start kind of resuming life as normal here in texas and um uh, i've been kind of just building my network back up you know and so my trade shows have taken a really big hit um so i'm having to build that back up and i'm starting to get some clients there but i really five years is just kind of get to play a little bit of catch up and hopefully exceed where i was around 2019 <laughs> that's the hope oh, man. it's crazy man i mean <laughs> I can tell you off the air of all the big name magicians that had to get real jobs during the, during, uh, you know, COVID, but yeah, yeah, we, we had savings. Thank God we don't yep. anymore, but we had yeah. savings. Yeah. Yeah. We were going to buy a house in 2019. My wife and I, we were going to buy a house and then, uh, that kind of sucked all of our money away. So we lit, we were, we were able to survive. Um, but right. we're still renting. So, you know, <laughs> dude, it's, it's tough. I mean, 20 grand we lost we lost a huge uh resort and you know the people that the people that we worked with either got got sucked up and sent to amazing places like jamaica or something like that to the big uh all-inclusive places or mm -hmm. they just got fired there was no activities director at this resort anymore so there's nobody to hire you anymore right um yeah yeah and then you know other stuff i mean there's just no activities directors there. That that division of that business is gone. Right. Yep. So who do you contact? It's everybody's rebuilding. It's it's tough, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's that's uh. But you just plug keep away. plugging. Keep plugging away. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. It, yeah. We, I I chose this on purpose. You know what I do. Uh. You know. Uh. I feel like sometimes I've, I've met some. Again, I'll I won't I won't name any names. So I've met some some magi who um, kind of feel like this is a second choice for them, like a last resort kind of thing. And I'm like, don't do magic then. Like, get out and do something. Like, this should. This is not a last resort. This is a privilege that we get to do this. So you better show up and be happy, you know, that you're doing this and not treat it that way. So, All right, so you're saying that this is their bricklaying job? Yeah. There's some people who just they're 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 they feel like they're just grinding it out, but not in a good way, you know, kind of more like Sisyphus. And I can't even. I, I can't exists. either. I can't either. So much, but there it's it's where you know somebody's stuck in a death job they don't like, but they're staying in it because it's paying their bills. Yeah, that's magic is for them somehow. I don't so, get it. I, I don't. I don't get it either. Yeah, talking a foreign language. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You know maybe, <laughs> me, I have I have one or two shows a year that is just set up wrong, and they will not fix it. And it is just a nightmare from beginning to end. As far as yeah. everything, as far as parking, as far as staging, as far as lighting, as far as help promotion, everything about it is just wrong. But they pay me well. I go there, I do my job, and I go home. That day, I'm clocking in, but I'm giving it everything I can with what I'm working with. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Two shows here, and they've been booking me for twenty years. I can't imagine if that was every single day. Yeah, every single day. Is that what they're dealing with? You think they just they're no, just I clocking they in? Just don't enjoy they're it. just seeing yes. it. Yeah, yeah. They're, they don't enjoy any of it. Yeah, that's it's it's like somebody like I said with a regular nine to five that don't they don't like it, but they're they don't want to leave it because it's, they have it's their the only thing they have. Yeah. My dad, yeah. yeah, my dad died when I was twenty five. I saved up 450 bucks, $500 for a video camera. I just wanted to videotape everything I could of my dad, knowing that he only had three months left. And I remember he had just got 
a, a shot in his arm that cost like eight hundred dollars for something. Who knows what it was? Wow. And uh, he had a band aid on it. Mom was putting a new band aid on it. And I, I remember the video because he doesn't have a shirt on. He's got a little tattoo and a little band aid above it. And I said, Dad, you got something you want to tell me? He said, Life is short. And he kind of, and he kind of, just one of these breathy inhales. And he was dead like a week later. And I have that video, wow. but I don't need it because it plays over in my head daily, daily. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you know, That's... with my little boys, I uh, three year old little boys. I'm in the office and I'm just grinding. I'm in there doing this and doing this and social media and working and marketing and this. But I take a break and I go in there and just wrestle and tackle them and try to play with them and try to beat them up. And all right, get that all right now back to work because I can't I can't turn it off because life is short. There, those moments are fleeting. I need to hang out with my boys. I need to. It's hard, yeah. man. It's hard. No, I get it. Yeah. Before before I sat down to, to do the, the podcast with you guys, I um. You know, I have this thing every night. I read both of my kids a book and I read them separate because there's a big age. When I say big age range at this age, it's different. My daughter's four. My son is seven. And so uh, I read them books every night, every night. We make a thing to go to the library. I read them a book every night. And sometimes it's the same book for my daughter. It's always something the same three books that she chooses. And my son, it's always something different, usually chapter books now. Um, but it's it's like. I had to make sure that, you know, we were, we were, everybody was fed, had their teeth brushed, had their pajamas on and were in bed so I could read them their story so that we could do this tonight and I could, you know, hit, hit the right uh, mark to, to join you. Um, but it was super important to me. I was like, no, we got to, we got to do it. We're not going to miss the ritual. We're not going to miss out on that time together. So that's awesome. yeah. I get it. I get it. You have to make that time. It's deliberate. It doesn't happen by accident. Yeah. And we take them around with us, and we've got to, they've got to see the world, man. They've got to see some cool things. I mean, my little girl was on the set of Carbon Arrow at two and a half years old. That's so cool. I, I, I tell the story of her waking up in the hotel, and I think we were on our way home. And she woke up, and she's stretching. She says, Dad, can I have a bagel? Honey, we don't have a bagel. We're in a hotel. <laughs> Dad, can I have a chocolate donut? We don't have chocolate donuts. Can I have a sprinkle donut? No. Can I have, a, 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 I don't know, she just a croissant? Lana, what are you doing? And then I thought, I took the picture of the, what is it craft called? Service. Craft service table at Carbonero. And she was going left to right in her mind. It started with <laughs> bagel, <laughs> then it went donuts, then it went croissant. <laughs> then it went so yeah. she was just going down the line. Can we go to work and get free food today? Oh, that's <laughs> no, so sweet. That's yeah. something I, I'm envious uh, of y'all about because um, my, my wife works as, a, she's actually the um, the manager at a Waffle House. And that's where we met years and years ago. Um, uh -huh. so, yeah, there, I have I, I have any number of gushy stories I can tell, but I don't want to embarrass her. Um, but, uh, I, I, you know, I, I get to see all these, I get to travel all over the country and I'm treated like royalty most, most of the time. Um, and I get to see all these amazing things. And, and all I have to send back is a really grainy, dark picture and a story and it's like i would really love to take her with me you know i'd love to share these things with her and let her see kind of what 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 a good part of my life actually looks like be able to share that and and i can't and so i i really envy what you guys have it's it's a beautiful and a really really cool thing so what does she what does she think about magic uh, she is not a fan of magic. <laughs> she, she, so she, she will can enjoy a program, but I think I have probably worn her out. I've, her and I've been together 16 years and I think she probably enjoyed magic. And when we got together, she enjoyed an occasional trick. I taught her a couple of magic tricks, you know? Um, but the last time I really ever got her with one was, um, and you know, this one, uh, it's the, the traveling match so you get like a matchbook and you rip it out you light it on fire and then it disappears and reappears inside the matchbook so we were at her, her now now my sister-in-law's wedding was before her and i were married but it was her sister uh, at her wedding which was like 2011 and uh we were just outside and there were a couple people you know smoking or whatever and i was like hey can i say those matches and i went Psh, and i did it for her and she was like what how do? Huh? And that was the last time I got her. And it was, it was 2011. So 
I'm waiting. Um, I have some other stuff and I'm just kind of sitting on it and I'm waiting till like maybe I'm 50 or 60 years old to kind of like still surprise her with something. She likes watching. She says she likes watching me perform for other people now. She likes to see that I can, how I can affect other people in such a positive way. And she enjoys seeing that joy that I, that I help create. So um, that's what she gets out of it now. But, you know, she doesn't want to pick another card. You know, so. I just got you something recently. Do you remember what it was? Because I taught it to the kids at the school group. And I was yeah, like, it was, it was where you cut the thing and you, but you had the, well, don't, don't reveal the method. Thing. What was it? <gasps> Clippo. Yeah. Clippo. Oh yeah. Clippo's awesome. You know, I never like, did Clippo, but I taught it to the kids. And I yeah. said, wait, first we go to Natalie. Natalie, what? Do it again. Wait, wait what? a minute. <laughs> yeah. Cause normally I can catch him. Like, yeah. Wait, I turn that around. Like, <laughs> absolutely happy to. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> but that got her good, and I, yeah. I took the kids, and I'm like, guys, no, listen, I don't get my wife very often. I, I got it with this one. You're gonna like this one. That's a that's a that's a you know posing in a he man kind of uh, no. uh, <laughs> look what I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, you you know you know I would I would recommend you take your wife on the road, but if she doesn't like magic, I don't want to. Just the same thing that we had discussions when, when we were having kids. I don't want a frumpy teenager on stage. If my daughter wants to be in the show, great. If she doesn't, I'm not going to, just like I wouldn't force the animals to be in the show if they're showing signs that they're not happy or healthy or, or want to yeah, be there. Yeah. I'm not going to force them to be in the show. Same thing right. with kids. Yeah. And uh, we let my daughter know that often now that she's 12 because she's starting to hit the, the hormone thing. Mm -hmm. We're like, honey, you're going to smile. And people see everything from when you pull up to when you leave. Smile. Be pleasant. You can't be frumpy. You can't yell back at us in the parking lot. You're under a magnifying glass. Even in the yeah. parking lot, they're watching. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we have to let her know that. But I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want your wife dragging along. But, I mean, the stuff that we've seen, millionaire banquets with ice sculptures and uh, Cirque du Soleil dancers in the hallway. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing, amazing things that. I don't remember unless I have video of it or she reminds me and we can bounce that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember that show. I, yeah. Oh, God, the, the God best I've been able to do is um, uh, a number of years ago. I say a number of years. It was maybe three, three or four years ago. Got hired to, this is right after, right, right after, right before COVID. Um, um, there's a really nice steakhouse that I used to perform in. And, um, I got hired to do a, a corporate event for one of their patrons. And um, he's like, I, he's like, Oh, are you, are you married? His name was Fred. He was retiring that year. And he was like, I really want to go out, like and give everybody something really special. You know, I think you're fab fabulous. I want, I want you to come do this and help send me off. And I was like, absolutely. So he's like, uh, um, his name was Fred. And he said, it's like, uh, I'd like, I'd like your wife to come too. I'd like to extend an invitation to her. And I was like, thank you. I greatly appreciate that, but I don't think she's going to come, you know? Um, he's like, is she, is she there? And I said, yeah. He's like, may I speak with her please? And I said, absolutely. So I gave the phone to my wife and uh, they had a conversation back and forth. I don't know all of the details of it, but, but whenever um I got the phone back. He's like, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys on whatever, whatever. And so he just insisted. And so she came and had a, a really nice dinner with the rest of the, uh, the company at, while I performed. And, and then they took us out to dinner another time later at a really nice fancy French restaurant. It was, uh, so she can be compelled to do it i don't know what magic fred was working himself but he was able to get her to come to one of these things and, and she really enjoyed herself so i'd like to do it more um right. but yes it's it's whatever it's okay i think she balances me out too because otherwise i think uh you know, I'll get I'll get off a stage or something. I'll be in Vegas and I'll do some big thing, and people are, you know, Bill Malone, you know, like that level of chanty, whatever. And you your head's gigantic, and you come home and they're like, "Oh, good, you're home." The the uh, the, the dog threw up in the other room. The cat crap is uh, needs to be cleared out, and you take the garbage out. You know, and it's just there's something very grounding about that. 
And so I appreciate that because I think I could, I'm the kind of person that I could probably get too full of myself if I didn't have that kind of foundation and that ground that I, that I need. What are you looking at me for? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. He's the same way. Yeah. You got to bring him down a notch. But you do every night. You're welcome. (laughs) It's a gift. It's a gift. Behind every great man is an even greater woman shaking her head in disgust. <laughs> Dude, she's awesome. I, you know, my wife takes care of me. But yeah, she she also lets me know what's hitting really well and what didn't hit, or if I'm repeating myself, or like right now, she's telling me that we've gone an hour on the podcast. She's on top of everything, man. Um, I love her. But you are awesome, and we talk so often. This hour just flew by, and I wasn't even trying. How quick was yeah. that? Uh, uh, wow. Yeah, it's already... Wow. You're right. I thought you were like uh, like padding for time. No, it's really been a whole hour. Yeah, I can't... We can we, we talk. You want to go for another two? We could... Uh, uh. I, I can, I can, we can go a little bit longer. APMagic.net. Yes, sir. Because uh, your last name, Roz with Spaghetti. Is Paletti. Paletti. Mm-hmm. But AP Magic, they don't have to worry about Paletti. They do AP. A is in uh, Allen. P is in Paletti. Magic.net. That's, That's easy me. enough, man. Yeah. yeah. So um, trade shows, mentalism, close up. What else? Yep. Pitch it uh, down. Corporate event. Pitch. Yeah. Corporate events, weddings, trade shows. Those are the, the big three. Awesome. Nice. Awesome. You're the best, man. Thank you for uh, you know, you're the this. best. We'll, have, we'll get you we'll get you back on again. It's so easy. Yeah, this is fun. For me too. For me too. It's always a joy. Thanks, dude. We'll wrap everything up by saying uh, see you yeah. next week. Check us out online at wesisley.com and patreon.com forward slash Wes underscore Isley for behind the scene videos, blooper videos, never before seen footage, discounts on merchandise, magic trick tutorials, and more. That's Wes Isley spelled W-E-S-I-S-E-L-I.